Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I think we've got a really exciting session for you this afternoon. Um, I'm going to, my name is Alan Bagnall. I'm an uh, interventional cardiologist from the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle. And we're going to be doing a session today about CT planning and robotic assisted PCI. And I hope what you're going to see today is a small glimpse into the future. I've got a great panel of colleagues with me. If I can introduce them, we've got Dr. Carlos Collett from Alst, Dr. Eric, Eric Wiffels from Alst, and Costas Benfis, who's the fellow in Alst as well. So a lot of Alst represented. Uh, we're going to be joined by a radiology colleague, um, Dr. al Qadi from Zurich, later on in the course. So um, let me introduce what our session objectives are. So firstly, we're going to see today how coronary CT angiography can bring additional value to the diagnosis of coronary artery disease, but more importantly, and the new thing, is that how it can help in pre-procedural planning and how to guide our PCI to get the best results for our patients. Secondly, we're going to be looking at the role of robotic-assisted PCI in enhancing procedural accuracy and improving both radiation safety and ergonomics within the cath lab. And finally, we're going to be looking at how to increase, how the increased stent, instant visibility of photon counting CT, which is one of the new developments, can help patients in the post-PCI evaluation uh, of their coronary artery disease. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my colleague and moderator, Dr. Carlos Collett. Thank you, Alan. As you mentioned, this is a session full of innovation, and I would like to encourage you to uh, please use your chat if you have any question from home or just stand up to the microphone if you have any other question. I'll get back to you. Thank you very much. So we're going to start off with a case presentation. This technology is all about patients, and it's all about how we integrate CT planning and robotics into our workflow. So what better place to start than with a case presentation? And if I can just get this going. Costas here is going to be giving this virtually, as you can see. So let's get this started. <coughs> Good morning, my name is Konstantinos Bernbeis. I'm an interventional cardiology fellow in Cardiovascular Center Alst, and I would like to present you a really interesting case. Uh, it is a robotic city-guided PCI. It is about a 64-year-old patient who presented to our outpatient clinic with a stable angina, class 2, with hypertension, dyslipidemia, and he is an active smoker. So we decided to perform a CT of the coronaries to screen the patient for coronary artery disease. The patient underwent a coronary CTA with a Siemens somatum force and the radiation was 6.7 millisievert. As you can see here, uh, there is a, a plaque in the proximal LAD. Here you can see it better a spotty lesion on the uh, proximal LAD, and we can see also a myocardial bridge. Here you see the curved MPR and the straight MPR. We can identify the spotty lesion in the proximal LAD, and uh, as you can see in the right uh, panel, uh, it is a low attenuation plaque with uh, positive remodeling and spotty calcifications. Here we see the FFR CT. The uh, FFR CT is positive in the distal LAD, while uh, the delta FFR is very low at uh, the uh, area of the lesion, 0.05. Here we can see the coronary angiography, a pretty normal right coronary artery. And key, here we can confirm uh, the results of the CT. There's a moderate lesion on the proximal LAD. The patient underwent also intravascular imaging. Here we can see the intravascular imaging. Uh, we see the images from the OCT. We can identify uh, plaque, uh, mainly lipidic plaque. And interestingly, we see also a small rupture proximally uh, to the uh, main plaque. Here we see a comparison between CT and OCT, which Carlos and Eric can describe better and come in more details later. So, what we have there is lots of information. We've got our typical invasive angiogram that we're all very used to seeing. We've got some invasive OCT images showing the details of the plaque and its morphology. And we have our CT 
and CTFFR analysis showing a significant lesion within the LAD. So I'm going to turn to my panel now, and Carlos, if you'd like to uh, talk us through a little bit about what you've seen there about this case, and in particular, what you took from the CT stuff that, that we had before we got to doing the invasive uh, investigations. So, Alan, there are several points here to highlight. First of all, I have to say that Costas is an interventional cardiology fellow, okay, and he's reading CT. So I see in the future that we that go into interventional cardiology training will need to learn how to look at the CT, and you see how much he already knows in a year and a half of training. What strikes me as well, uh, uh, Alan, is the fact that we're dealing with a significant lesion in terms of physiology. We have an FFR that is below 0 0.8, but we're also dealing with a high-risk lesion. We have seen in the CT very nicely how this plaque has a positive remodel. You see a big plaque burden, and by OCT, it's a thickfa with lipid-rich plaque plus plaque rupture. So I think we have sufficient ar arguments both in the plaque composition, plaque risk uh, part, and also on the physiological aspect of the lesion. So for me, this is something that I've learned from the presentation of Costas, and it's very nice to see the added value that CT brings to the information that we have on top of the, let's say, even the invasive image. So I think there were some really important points in there. We had the FFR CT, which tells you, should I be doing this lesion? And the answer was very clearly yes. But the second thing, and perhaps most importantly, were the features on the CT, which showed high-risk plaque, which was then confirmed on the OCT. We didn't necessarily need the OCT to, to see that there were high-risk features here. Well, I think that the, the type of information that you get from both is a bit different. And I think that I, I like to see, for example, with OCT, we cannot see plaque bird. The penetration of the light is too, uh, sh is too shallow to see the, the, the external elastic membrane, but that comes from CT. So you have actually two modalities, giving you a lot of information, giving you the distribution of the plaque, giving you the thickness of the fibrous cap by OCT, that you don't have that, of course, in CT. But we were discussing is that, and you will see probably in the next presentation more clearly, that the only way that we have today to look at plaque in a three-dimensional way is with CT mainly because when we look at OCT, we're looking at cross-sections, at a tomographic cross-section. With CT, you get the volume, and sometimes that aspect of the three-dimensionality of CT facilitates the interpretation of the plaque. That's great. So we're now going to go on to have a look at the case planning of this case, and Eric and Carlos are going to be discussing this in the next video. Whilst we're doing that, I want you to all be thinking about from what you've seen on the invasive angiogram, on the OCT so far, how would you be doing this case right now? How would you be planning it just with the information you have? And then we're gonna see what, what extra information the CT might bring in here. These are my disclosures. So in the, in the video that we're gonna show next is Eric and I entering the cat lab and understanding the disease that we're going to treat looking by a three-dimensional reconstruction of not only the lumen, but the plaque. And based on that, planning the procedure in terms of all the uh, procedural steps that we need to perform PCI. So I'm just gonna click play. Welcome in the cath lab. We're now in the Siemens room. I'm here together with uh, Dr. Carlos Collet. We are ready to, uh, to start the case, but before starting the CT-guided robotical case, we would like to know a little bit more about CT and CT guidance. Carlos. Perfect, Eric. So uh, thank you for this opportunity to actually plan the procedure before we actually uh, jump inside the cat lab. So what you have on the screen now is a 3D reconstruction of the complete coronary tree of this patient. You can see immediately the distribution of the plaque. You see some colors there. The white color is calcium. The green color is, of course, a plaque, non-calcified plaque. And of course, the red is the blood. And you can see here how we can have a full overview of the coronary tree of this patient. But we have already seen, uh, presented by Costas Eric, that the lesion, actually the culprit lesion for the angina of this patient is located into the LAD. So I'm gonna ask now to actually focus on the LAD. So let's remove the, the other vessels and let's focus on the LAD. And what we have seen, Eric, is that there is a lesion in the mid-LAD just before the take of the diagonal branch. So this is all the information that I'm giving you before we actually come inside the lab.
The first question, of course, is, is there a lesion, yes or no? We know by the FFRCT that this is a significant lesion generating a, a pressure drop in the NAD of 0 0.70, although with a small translational gradient. Nevertheless, we have seen that this is a high-risk plaque with rupture confirmed by OCT, and this means that it's a high-risk plaque for events. Look at this. So here we have an overview of the distribution of the plaque relative to the LAD and relative to the bifurcation. So at this moment, Eric, first, the first thing I, ca I can tell you is that we will need to do a very cranial projection, and we can select this, of course, live when we're doing the case. But I want to get your feedback on how do you assess, at least at this stage, the three-dimensionality of the, of, the, of the coronary tree and, of course, its relations with the plaque. Well, what uh, for, for me is striking that the plaque starts, okay, in the proximal LED, but it's much longer than I initially would appreciate uh, in the traditional uh, imaging. That's, that's the first thing. Secondly, we can already see that there is, well, probably this is the region where the LED is, is, is in the intramyocardial and where the bridge is. We should keep away from that bridge. That is the classical teaching, I think. It's still the case. Um, regarding the vessel, we see some positive remodeling here, I think. Yeah, we can go in depth. So um, what I'm going to yeah. do now is actually provide you with a cross-sectional view. Okay. So we can go to a cross-section and let's go immediately to the MLA. You see here on the bottom of the screen what we call a straight NPR. And in the straight NPR, what it strikes me is at the level of the MLA, as you mentioned, there is a huge positive remodeling. If you look at the top right corner of the screen, you will see that this is a huge plaque with some dark areas in the middle, and these dark areas on CT corresponds to necrotic core. So we're dealing here with a high-risk plaque and positive remodeling, and of course, a huge plaque burden around the MLA. The other thing that we can do, Eric, is to understand the distribution of the plaque relative to the side branch, because that will help you know if you can probably stop before the diagonal branch, or you have to gel the diagonal branch and do a provisional bifurcation technique. So let's go back, and I'm gonna drive you through very slowly. Let's go to the MLA again, and go slowly distal to the diagonal branch to see where the plaque starts. So you see here a lot of plaque, lipidic plaque. Here we cannot stop, otherwise we're gonna have a dissection. There is the calcium at six o'clock. If you go a little bit down, you see there, go back, go back, two cross sections back. There, there is still some sort of, a, of plaque depicted by the calcium at one o'clock, and this is just before the side branch. If you go two cross sections distal, please, the, you see the side branch there at yeah, nine yeah, o'clock? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, Eric, I think that we don't have enough space to land this stand before the takeoff of, this, of the diagonal. So I would suggest that we uh, cover this diagonal branch and we stop the stand around this segment that looks pretty normal by CT. Would you agree on that approach? Yeah, yeah. The, this case is very, very uh, illustrative that we use a CT scan to look at the morphology of the plaque, the length of the plaque, the composition of the plaque. That's one. But secondly, we use that information to guide our strategy. Huh? We would be tempted to stop next uh, before the bifurcation, but now we know that we really have to stand beyond the bifurcation and, as you say, jail the diagonal branch. Perfect. I think we're going to come back to this three-dimensional plaque model when you are ready with the robotic setup in order to understand better what is the length and diameter of the stand that we need to implant. And of course, it's important to mention that this image is live during the procedure and it's actually synchronized with our C-arm. Yeah. And every time we turn the C-arm, we actually see exactly the same, but not the lumen that we see very nicely with angio, but the plaque composition, which is equally important to understand the response of the case uh, for PCI. That's great. Thanks very much, guys. So I say, if anybody has any questions as we go along, please feed them through into Costas or come up to the microphone here. That we don't have any questions eh, for the time. Okay. So I think what I was getting from that is in advance of your case, you're not only able to see should you be in there, but to really think about how you're going to do this and really understanding both plaque morphology, but importantly, plaque distribution as well. And you get all that even without having to go to the time expense of doing intravascular imaging in side branches, for example. So, Eric, if I can come to you first. 
How do you see that working in your cath lab? Do you, is this the sort of thing that you, that you would do before a case to be able to help you plan out what you expect to happen? Well, to, to be honest, uh, interventional cardiology has changed for me the last uh, two years. I've been practicing for more than 20 years now. And since that CT scan uh, was introduced, now suddenly we know everything that there is to know about the patient before I enter the room, if we have CT scan and it's reconstructed, of course. This has changed not only my journey as a physician, but also the journey of the patient, but that's something to discuss upon later. So with all that information, we have a good diagnosis and a formulation of a strategy before you're even scrubbed, before the patient is on the table. So this has really changed. And before that uh, change, well, we, we were doing it the old fashioned way, huh? putting in the sheet and then, okay, we will see. And I think that's still the case, isn't it? When Even when we're really encouraging people to increase their use of intravascular imaging, it's only when you start using intravascular imaging that you realize the true extent of plaque and also then how that might have to adapt. But you're still having to think on the fly. And is it changing things for you, Carlos? Well, I think that planning a procedure with, with CT offers you so much. You are, we're focusing in this case on plaque distribution, which I think it's an important aspect because it determines a stent length. But I'm going to bring to the table the fact that going inside the case, understanding the complexity of the disease before you even inject is a game changer. So we're used to coming in the case, you know, you scrub, you make the first injection, and then you have to take a decision ad hoc in 20, 30 seconds in a coronary vessel. I think those days are, are, are over. I think we have to be aware of the disease that we're treating. We need to understand, for example, who's the best operator for that particular case, what is the complexity of that case. And at the same time, what has happened in our CAD lab is that we have improved at the same time the efficiency of the CAD lab because we understand that complex cases take longer time. There's a rota case, there's a simple case. The allocation of time is different. The efficiency of the CAD lab changes. So there are so many ways how pre-procedural planning with CT, which, well, you come from the UK. I think that you were the pioneers on pushing the CT first for everyone. We have followed Europe, but we're still uh, increasing the numbers. Is more and more, and I, I look at the colleagues and see that we are faced by the fact that the majority, at least in my cat lab, of stable patients come to the lab already with a CT. And one of the things that these three-dimensional reconstructions allows for is to understand the information from the CT very easily. The white is calcium, the green is uh, fibrotic plaque. So you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to look at the actuals. This is digested for you and is presented in the way that we show in the, in the presentation. And I'm assuming, therefore, that with that 3D model moving with your angiogram, you can presumably select the views that are best to show the side branches for when you're doing stent in, and you can decide that in advance. Yeah, you know, when uh, uh, a long time when I did my PhD, there was a lot of emphasis on selecting the projection for the case. And that is true. If you go, any CT software can tell you the projection. But the PCI is very dynamic, you know? You start doing some things, then something changed in the procedure. So having it, the three-dimensional ge uh, geometry inside the lab, next to your angio, and as you said, what we do now is we move the C-arm, and you see the geometry moving, and you say, ah, here is the one, is the position that I want to spend contrast, I want to spend radiation. So you actually end up reducing radiation and reducing contrast, which translate in procedural safety. So I think this is one, again, another advantage of having this, and it's, it's very easy to see this next to you flying with your, with your angiographic machine. And thinking now, again, before you've even gone in there, presumably you can do virtual stenting on this like you can do on an invasive angiogram. So you can predict what your post-PCI FFR, FFR will be based on where you place the stent, how long the stent will be, its diameter, etc. Yeah, so, yeah, you're right. There is a new tool from uh, FFRCT. It's called the FFRCT planner that actually allows you to make the virtual stenting and understand what's going to be the post-PCI FFR. And this tool is very accurate. We validate this tool prospectively uh, last, in the last couple of years. And the difference with the invasive post-PCI FFR is 0 0.02 
FFR unit. So it's, it's a very precise and, and you can play with it. You can say, let's put a longer stand, let's put a shorter stand. Of course, taking into account the plaque distribution, that is quite important. But you can have an estimate of the degree of revascularization that you're offering to that patient. So you see how many ways CT mm. is changing, as Eric mentioned, the, the way that we did these cases in the past. Yeah, adding to that, the journey of the interventionalist is changing because you can select your material, you, you can select your strategy, but also the journey of the patient is changing because upfront you're able to identify those patients that can be treated safe in a same-day discharge and those patients that cannot be treated safe in a same-day discharge. So this translates into the usage of, of your resources and has a financial component as well. If you need financial components to uh, to to talk to your uh, management, of course. All right. Well, Eric, if I can invite you up yeah. to the podium now. Eric is one of the pioneers and uh, somebody who's really at the forefront of robotic PCI, and we're going to use this same case, having done the planning of it. Eric's now going to show us how using robotic PCI helped execute the case. Working in Alst, as everybody here does. Um, my conflict of interests are clear, are depicted here, and we will start the pre-recorded case now. So here we are at the, at the control room. We are looking at the Corindus robot. We are looking at the synchronized image of the C-arm and the reconstructed images of the CT scan. We are able to move the C-arm outside the cath lab, and we're ready to go. So the first thing I'm going to try is to wire the LED. Then we are going to wire the diagonal branch, and we do, we do a pre-dilatation of the LED. So, as you can see, we have three joysticks. The joysticks, with the joysticks, you're able to move the materials. The middle joystick is responsible for movement of the uh, guide wire, and this is the first one we will do. Look, you, you just push the joystick and the wire goes on. There are three pre-programmed instances that you can use. You can use a technique off, then the wire goes back and forth. That's pretty much it. You have the wiggle maneuver, where the wire is wiggling, and then you have the spin maneuver, where the wire spins around its own axis. And then you have a special one, it's called rotate on retract. That's when you retract the wire, that the wire will rotate. And this is a way of easy accessing side branches. But let's try to uh, wire the LED without. It goes nicely in, AP cranial please. You see how nice the uh, synchronization is? And I will try to use the information of the CT scan to guide my wiring. I'm in the... I buckle the wire in order to be... Okay, this is nice. It's nicely distal. Now we're going to change towards the diagonal branch and insert the other wire. I've activated the wiggling. Yeah, and it's okay. The beauty of this system is that you can always try to, well, you can always measure what you do. I will show you later on. First, I'm going to bring in the balloon. I asked for a 20 long 3.0, and I'm going to put it in the lesion and then ask Carlos what he thinks. So Eric, the, so I see that you have pretty far, so you have wired the two vessels, and what I can tell you here that indeed the plaque goes beyond yeah. the, the bifurcation, and also proximally, you see that the plaque it starts actually much, much before the MLA. So that is quite important for, your, for the selection of the stand length. What we can do is to make a measurement in the three-dimensional space 
which will tell you exactly what is the length of the lesion, yeah. not only of the angiographic lesion, but also in a sort of uh, mimicking intravascular imaging, what is the extension of the plaque. Yeah. So what we're going to do here, we have some very nice tools. These are markers. You have seen here that I'm going to place my marker in a normal cross-section after the diagonal. Yeah. So you see here the diagonal at 9 o'clock. I'm going to go a little bit distal, and here it looks pretty nice. At this level, the lumen by CT is 3.4. And let's look at the proximal landing zone then. The proximal landing zone, let's go into the MLA and we go back. Look at this. This is a huge lilipidic plaque, and you might be tempted to land here with the angiography yeah. because here the lumen is pretty big already, yeah. but there's a lot of plaque and repeated plaque. So I'm going to go a little bit back to select a normal cross-section, which is here, Eric. So we would need at least 24 or 25 millimeters of, of stent to cover not only the angiographic lesion, but also the complete plaque. They did change our strategy, Carlos, because Looking at the conventional angiography, you would be tempted, or I would be tempted without CT scan, to put my stent just in front of the bifurcation, and and then, according to those images, land my stent in the my stent in the shoulder of a, of a plaque. Uh, do you agree on this? I fully agree. I have to tell you also one more thing, Eric, uh, that if you go a little bit more proximally in the LED, you have plaque again. Yeah. So I think you have to be very precise and you have the tool, the robot is uh, the absolute indicated tool to be very precise. ECG is okay. Pressure is okay. Okay, you can deflate, stop. So, Eric, can I... Yes. I'm going to tell you additional amount of information now because I see that you are ballooning through the bifurcation and one of the things that is a, is a criteria to predict side branch occlusion is the presence of disease in the side branch. Yeah. To look at this with intravascular imaging, we would need to have two pullbacks, one in the side branch, one yeah. in the main branch, and then analyze the two. With this tool, you have a live plaque map everywhere. Yeah. So what I have done now is I have placed my center line to the diagonal branch, and I can tell you that the diagonal branch has no plaque at the level of the ostium. So there is no plaque in the osteal diagonal, which might be a predictor that your side branch will remain open after standing. And I'm focusing on the CT reconstruction, and I will show you guys now with the angio where we are. Let's uh, inflate the stand, please. Go. How much is this? 10, go to 14, please. Okay, now we are entering with a non-compliant balloon. And, and again, we are using the CT scan and the reconstruction to nicely put the balloon where we want it to be. Yeah, you can inflate here, please. Go ahead, bring it up to 12, please. Okay, with a clear stent imaging, I'm able to identify the three to four struts that still have to be expanded. I'm going to take the balloon three millimeters back, exactly. And you can inflate, please, go to 14. Nice result, ending up with a stent coming from the proximality just behind the bifurcation. We nicely avoided the intramyocardial bridge. And I think we're done here. We're going to remove with the robot our guide. We're done, and for the record, we have used 63 mils of contrast today. Thank you. Brilliant. Wow. Uh, just wow, Eric. That looked absolutely fantastic. I think what I took away from that video were several things. Number one, you didn't have a lead coat on. You looked very relaxed and the environment to be working in looked very safe. And the second thing that I took away from it was the absolute precision that robot uh, gave you.
the fact when you saw that you had a few stent struts to cover, you could say, I want to move this back three millimeters. Click, click, click. Three millimeters it was. Beautiful. So we've got a question from the audience, which I think is a really important one when we're thinking about uh, robotic PCI. And that is, how good it is it at doing side branches? How good is it in particular at crossing stent struts, for example? Well, addressing that question is, is not really difficult. It's very good at addressing side branches and, and doing uh, even difficult anatomies uh, because the pre-programmed features that you have in the robot are in such a way that with a little training, I think, and Kostas will, uh, will say that I'm right, um, <laughs> as always. No, but w within 10 to 15 cases, uh, an, an experienced interventionist can can tackle almost all lesions. So this is an answer to can the robot tackle uh, normal and difficult cases? Yes, it can. And the, the, the advantages of the robot are, in my opinion, uh, certainly, first of all, you get the operator out of the dangerous situation which a radiation uh, uh, cat lab suite always is. Secondly, you're sitting behind the large big screen you have a nice view on, on the imaging. If you combine it with the CT guidance, you can really focus on what you, are, you have to do. Um, that's very important. You don't wear lead, so the ergo ergonomic problem is there as well. And then last but not least, you can focus very good, but you can tackle the problem in a very precise way. As you say, on a sub-millimeter niveau, you can place your stent or, or your other devices. And it's not only stents that you can put in. We have done renal denervations. We have done uh, IVL. Um, so I, I think uh, this is a very promising uh, technology. So w one of the things that you mentioned, Alan, is that when you look at how the robot is promoted, there is, of course, radiation uh, it comes in top of the list, which I think is an important parameter. However, this is a complete different PCI. You mentioned, you know, you are in a different environment. You're in the cat lab, you have, you have the catheter, you have the thing, you have the blood coming from the white connector. You, you are kind of looking at 10 different things at the same time. Here, all this is away. You are concentrated in the screen that is very is close to you. You are very calm. Sometimes Eric didn't say, but sometimes he has a coffee. <laughs> He's drinking a coffee while doing the PCI. And it's a completely different experience. So you do a PCI in a state of mind completely different of what you are used to do in a normal PCI. And that, for me, it's a, it's a unique feeling to have. And I can imagine knowing what you're going to do beforehand just adds to that feeling of, I can predict what's going to happen here, and I'm in control of everything. The other thing I really loved about that was the fact that when you're making your balloon size measurements, that it was all done in the three-dimensional space on the CT scan, so that you had none of the issues with foreshortening that you get with the different angles. The sinking really helps, huh? and, uh, and it's very interesting. Of course, while setting up a robotic program, you have to invest some time in training as well. You have to train the operator, but the team, the nursing team as well, But because installing a robotic program means that the role, the classical role of the cath lab nurse is emancipating. Uh, we, we will ask more from the traditional uh, cath lab nurse, which makes it more interesting as well, of course. That's great. Well, we're going to come on to the third part of our talk now, and I'm hoping that the technology uh, is going to work for us. Um, it does. Yes, I think it does. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome, every, uh, Hatem. This is Hatem Alkadi, who's a radiologist in Zurich. I think one of the elephants in the room that we've not spoken about with CT uh, so far is the fact that it struggles when you've got stents in vessels because you get a lot of blooming artifacts. And the same can be true with heavy calcification. So Hatem here is going to talk to us about a new development in this area and how it hopes to solve some of those problems. And this is photon counting CT. Over to you, Hatem. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much um, for being invited um, to this um, really exciting session. I enjoyed very much what I saw so far, although not staying with you in Paris. 
Um, I'm very happy to see that CT coronary angiography, you know, changed from, you know, what it was perceived as a, as a competitor to catheter angiography 15 years ago to a modality which really helps us, you know, optimizing, you know, planning interventions uh, and optimizing eventually also outcome uh, of our patients. Um, but when we look back to this case uh, that you showed uh, before in this session, uh, we also have to realize that we cannot have enough high spatial resolution. So we need a superb spatial resolution for this plaques, for diagnosing the high risk plaques, to diagnose spot decalcifications, um, positive remodeling. Uh, and all these uh, worrisome plug features. And also we need to have a modality which enables us to look at coronary stents in vivo in a sufficiently accurate manner. And now it comes the role to photon counting uh, um, CT. Um, these are my uh, disclosures. In a nutshell, very briefly, not too technical, um, this is the, uh, an illustration how conventional CT works. We have the X-ray photon crossing the patient uh, where we have an indirect conversion to electrical energy via scintillator and the light sensor. So we lose some information through this indirect conversion process here, photon counting CT, where we have a direct conversion of the X-ray photons to electrical energy. And not only to that, not only that we have a direct conversion, which improves our image quality, reduces noise. Um, it is also that the energy level of the photon, of each individual photon, is counted. This is also the reason why this machine is photon counting CT. The result of that is that we have a reduced radiation dose. Um, that we apply to our patients. We have an improved spatial resolution. We have an improved signal or contrast to noise ratio, and we have reduced artifacts. Just two case examples, of course, not the patient that we have seen before in the session, but um, two different patients with a lot of calcifications here in the aortic root, but also here in the distal left main and proximal LED. And you see here a standard reconstruction on the left side with 0 0.6 millimeters, which is already very good. This is a somatome force um, um, a reconstructed uh, image. And here you see the same section with the photon counting CT and you see how different the plaque composition looks with the photon counting CT. 0.2 millimeter slice thickness, a much higher um, also in plane spatial resolution. And now when you look at the case with a stand on the left lower side here as a coronary stand in the mid LAD here, you can certainly say this is a patent stand. But I would not tell the referring cardiologist too much about what is going on within the lumen. Um, but with the photon counting detectors, this is the same case with the ultra high resolution CT reconstruction, 0.2 millimeter reconstruct. You see the stand struts, you see almost no or no blooming artifacts from the stand. You have perfect visualization of the stand lumen, also shown in these corresponding reconstructions. So this is very, very early experience with the scanner. We have this, uh, mod this ultra high resolution mode available since um, end of January, um, but results are really very, very promising. This is what I wanted to Great. contribute. Thank you so much. Those are wonderful images, wonderful images, and particularly impressed with the degree of detail inside that stent. Is that something that you think can change how we use CT in patients who've already undergone intervention? Yeah, definitely. I think that one of the biggest challenges that we have today in patients after PCI when they come back with, with chest pain is we or choose another different type of test because we don't want to get, uh, you know, the, the blooming artifact coming from the stent hampers the evaluation of the lumen. So we, we, we choose another non-invasive test or just they go to angiography. So I, I, I do believe that this technology is a game changer. And we talk about stents, but also for calcifications. Huh? I think that the value of this technology in patients with high, cal with high calcium burden is also huge. So I think we're about to see uh, 
complete. We said CT for suspected uh, coronary artery disease, and we're going to move that to CT too. Even with known coronary artery disease, simply because we have these new tools that kind of improve the limitations of the previous technology. Great. Before I move to the sum up, is there any other questions from the audience that we've not had come through? Okay. Well, I hope you've all been as excited as I have been about today's presentation. Before I started learning all about this, it was new to me as well, and I've been blown away with a lot of the stuff that I've seen here today. So let's uh, talk about what we've seen. Firstly, we have seen the role of CT in the diagnosis of coronary artery disease. So it tells us through both its anatomical and importantly, its uh, functional uh, assessment, who needs to come to the cath lab. That's the first and most important thing I'd say. But what's new, and really for me is the game changing thing, is about taking all of that information that we have in that 3D data set from CT and using that to very precisely plan our PCI, to deliver our PCI, and even to predict what the outcome will be in terms of whether we will achieve a non-ischemic FFR at the end. We've seen some lovely demonstrations today of robotic PCI, and as someone who's been working in the cath lab for 20 years now, it's a very welcome thing there just from the ergonomic side of things. But I was really interested to see about how the robotic stuff, particularly when combined with the information to help you plan the procedure, offers a completely new paradigm of how we deliver PCI and how we make decisions in the cath lab and how we deliver those for our patients. And finally, this new frontier of photon counting CT really gives us, as Carlos was saying, an opportunity to move CT from where it is now in the patients who don't have known coronary artery disease to moving it through to the next stage, which is using that to guide our procedures, and then finally to follow up those same patients with CT. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>